Welcome to the second unit on semaphores. In this unit, we'll be talking about binary and counting semaphores. Your learning objectives for this unit are first to be able to describe the differences between binary and countering semaphores. Second is to identify the correct type of semaphore to use for solving different kinds of problems. And third, to identify the correct way to initialize the value for a semaphore for a particular problem. So the first type of semaphore we'll talk about here is a binary semaphore. This is also known as a mutex semaphore. The goal for this kind of semaphore is to provide mutual exclusive access to a resource. This is really just a way of implementing a lock, and it means that only one thread or process is allowed entry to the semaphore at a time. A binary semaphore is really a limited form of a semaphore where the counter value is initialized to one and never allowed to go above one. This makes it act as exactly like a lock. Now you might ask, if we have locks like we talked about last time, why do we need semaphores? The difference is all the locks we talked about previously are spinning locks, which means that while they're running, they're sitting there spinning using the CPU to check to see if the lock is available. This means that when the lock is held, the CPU for threads that are waiting is not available to do useful work. If a lock is held for a long period, this can waste a lot of time. In contrast, a semaphore, remember, releases the CPU when it's waiting by blocking and waiting on a queue instead. So the major use for a binary semaphore is to use with a lock, and the key feature of a binary semaphore is the counter is initialized to one. So here's an example of how you might uh, replace code that used lock with a semaphore where we used to have a calls to acquire and release a lock, we instead call wait to wait for a semaphore and signal to signal the semaphore. The question here is, what value should we use to initialize semaphore? And as I just said, the answer is one, because we only want to let exactly one thread acquire the semaphore at a time. The second type of semaphore is the type, sort of the more general kind I described in the previous lecture, and this is called a counting semaphore or a counted semaphore. As I mentioned, this is usually used to represent a resource with many units available, and it allows multiple threads or processes to enter as long as more resources are available. The number of resources is, in, is indicated by the counter. Um, in this case, you would initialize the counter or the value to n. This is usually used for conditional synchronization, which means when one thread is waiting for some other thread to finish a piece of work before it continues. So a standard way to do this, place for this, is the bounded buffer problem. This is the... Uh, uh, version of the producer-consumer problem I talked about last time. In this case, it's a very specific instance. There's a buffer in memory with a finite size of n entries. When a producer produces something, it inserts it into the buffer um, and consumes one of the entries in the buffer. The consumer process removes an entry from the buffer. Again, the problem that we want to solve is the producer has to wait until there's space available in the buffer, and the consumer has to wait until the buffer has something in it. These two processes should run concurrently, so we need a synchronization mechanism to control access to the shared variables describing the buffer state. So here is a very simple case, which is a single producer thread and a single consumer thread and a shared buffer. As I said, the requirement is the consumer must wait for the producer to fill the buffer, and the producer must wait for the consumer to empty the buffer. The buffer here is indicated by the yellow bars in the middle. So the standard solution to this uses three semaphores. First of all, we need a mutex semaphore to protect access to shared state. In this case, the shared state is the data structure representing the buffer, perhaps an array. The second semaphore is a counting semaphore full buffer, which is used to indicate that the buffer is full. And the final semaphore is empty buffer, which is used to represent that the buffer is empty. So let's look at the code now. So starting with the producer, we see the first thing it does is it waits for there to be an empty buffer available. This makes sure that it won't run until the consumer has made some space available. It then waits in the mutex variable to get mutual exclusion to the buffer data structure. It fills the buffer. It then signals the mutex to release mutual exclusion. And finally, signals full buffer to indicate that there's at least one full buffer available. So from this code, can you figure out what are the correct values to initialize these semaphores to? Well, we know the mutex should be initialized to one because it's a, a binary or mutex semaphore. What about empty buffer? Well, in this code, empty buffer represents the number of empty buffers. So when you first start the program, all the buffers are empty, so empty buffer should be initialized to the number of buffers in the system. Similarly, full buffer here represents the number of full buffers. So the system starts with no, all empty buffers and no full buffers, so full buffer should be initialized to zero. Looking at the consumer code now, it is very similar to the producer code. 
It also, here it starts out waiting for there to be a full buffer. This is how the consumer makes sure there is some data to be consumed. It then waits in the mutex to get access to the shared data structure. It gets a buffer and uses it, indicated by the code in the middle. It then signals the mutex to release mutual exclusion on the shared data structure. And finally, it will signal there's an empty buffer available because it just emptied it with the use call. So um, if run, the producer may run for a while. And after the producer runs for a while, it may create a number of full buffers and reduce the number of empty buffers. When the consumer runs, it will reduce the number of full buffers and increase the number of empty buffers as it uses them. So this is a short example on how to use semaphores, and we'll talk about more of them during lecture. Please take the second quiz on semaphores now before coming to lecture.